Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Visibility Era, the podcast. Today, Bridget and I are with amazing publicists in the industry. So I know you've heard from us talking about media and PR a million different ways. And so today we get to hear from two other experts and their perspectives on things. So we have Sarah and Amanda with us. I'll let them introduce themselves. I think it's very cool how they have super different backgrounds uh, that brought them to PR. So there'll be lots of different flavors, lots of different perspectives today. So Sarah, do you want to start? Sure. So I still don't even know what communications PR is. Honestly, I remember being in college, people studying media relations, communications, and I, again, had no concept of that. Um, So I really did just kind of fall into it naturally, largely through people I was connected with who maybe noticed skills in me that I didn't see in myself. And I studied anthropology and linguistics. So I was always interested in storytelling, helping people communicate effectively, and really just distilling people's messages um, and helping people. Yeah, I love introducing people. So I think that's probably part of the whole PR side of things for me, but um, it all just is a career that just kind of unraveled naturally through connections, relationships I built. I love that. I love that. It's so funny. I don't think anyone, wait, Amanda, have you, did you go to school for PR? No, I did not. (laughs) Mm -mm. I feel like most PR people did not. I feel like with the three of us were talking about this and it it tends to be like one of those fall into it career, like stemming from something else. Oh, 100%. Unless they go into it for a specific niche, like fashion Mm -hmm. or beauty, like nine times out of 10, they're just like, oh, I kind of like fell into this and Mm -hmm. this is my career now. But um, our journalism majors that that go over to the dark side, right? Yes, yes. (laughs) yes. Amanda, can you introduce yourself? Because I think your background's quite fascinating as well. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Amanda, I um, have worked in PR for 25 years, which really is scary when I say that out loud. And I sort of fell into it. I had an English degree. I ended up working in uh, pharmaceutical companies right out of college and realized that this was, you know, with a liberal arts background, that the science part was not that interesting to me. And so I started to be like, okay, how can I stay here? Because it was a very lucrative place to work, but work in an area that actually felt interesting to me. And so I moved into some like marketing coordination roles and then just sort of angled my way and eventually found my way into the PR department um, and then did that for about 10 years. I moved like through three companies, realized that I didn't love the corporate environment. And so I transferred into consulting about, I don't know, like eight to 10 years in, give or take. And I loved that for a long time because it actually felt very entrepreneurial for me. And I had a lot more control over the types of accounts that I took on. Um, I was able to find ways to have a lot of consistency by working with big agencies and forming partnerships there. And, you know, now about three years ago, I just decided that healthcare really wasn't for me anymore, or at least not in the, the traditional sense of healthcare. And I took about a year off and ended up meeting all these people in the health and wellness and personal development space that were interested in PR and started to realize that there was a whole new opportunity for me. And so I completely transitioned my work over the last few years and now, um, you know, get to support like really revolutionary founders, some of them in healthcare, a lot of them in wellness that are doing things differently and challenging a lot of that conventional thinking, which is something that I love. And I also incorporate human design and the gene keys into my work, which is really fun because it allows me to really personalize communications for my clients and even for myself and how I put myself out there and, you know, attract new clients and, you know, I just, I love, you know, PR, like Sarah said, like, what is PR really? Because it's so many different things um, to try to like say it in one sentence. But one of the things that I love about PR that I think was unexpected for me um, is that it's so much about connections and networking. And that's something that I've always loved. And so for me, in addition to getting clients in media and on podcast, I love when they create relationships on the other side of that too, <clears throat> excuse me, which then lead to something even more fruitful. So I just think it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Totally. I might be the only one out of the four of us who studied communications and PR, but actually didn't do it, you know, which is hilarious uh, since you guys are the publicist here, but, but I love this. And I think it is really a great reminder of how like our backgrounds can be so non-linear and yet like we arrive here because many things you know we find some Mm -hmm. interest some passion some person that like opens Mm -hmm. a doorway for us and we're like oh my god this is amazing um so amanda you kind of started alluding to that question of like what pr is and i think we'd love for either one of you like we've said it we've tried to explain right to our audience like what pr is and what it's not but i'd love to hear in your words like what is pr and what is it not 
relationships, obviously. What else? Sarah, you want to go first? I'll invite you. Oh, goodness. I think (laughs) it's a matter of just generating positive buzz around a person, a brand. How can we create a positive reputation that can then feed into other opportunities, whether it's brand partnerships, collaborations, marketing. Like I'm thinking with the podcast example, a lot of my clients are, I mean, my main focus is podcasts and live speaking events for clients and founders in particular. And we use a lot of that content, video, in-person video content for our paid ad spend. So it's like, that's where PR then bridges or touches up against um, marketing. And then also like with partnerships, like we'll do podcasts that are hosted by other brand founders and then use that to just develop that partnership. Um, Or also like with influencers, like hosts who have, or um, podcast hosts who happen to be influencers. It's like, we'll use our ambassador program for, to leverage unpaid interviews. So like there are a lot of different ways where PR intersects with other aspects of a business, which I think is what makes it um, somewhat confusing for people. I think a lot of people maybe think PR is more marketing than it really is, but I think of marketing more as pay to play, whereas PR is like truly earned. Yeah. I I love that, Sarah. I love that you shared too, that in your eyes, it's more about creating a positive buzz because Mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many times I tell people that I'm a publicist. Actually, just last week, I told somebody mm-hmm. that I was a publicist and they started telling me about some celebrity gossip. And I was like, no, 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 I don't do damage control. That's not what I do. Mm-hmm. And I, but I think that that's what people think about when they think about mm-hmm. PR. Cause it's like this weird industry where unless you're in it, you really don't understand what it is. You're like, oh, it's marketing. Oh, it's sales. Oh, it's damage control. But I think you did a great, beautiful explanation of what PR is, which is really creating that positive, that positive buzz, that brand awareness. Um, and I also really want to circle back eventually. I think we'll, we'll naturally get back to it, but you work a lot with brands that have budgets and like what Mm. it looks like to have a budget for PR and to use it where it's not used for pay to play. And we'll we'll get to Mm. all of this, but it's more used for, um, different types of areas that can really support a PR campaign. So I love that. I'm putting a pin in it. (laughs) Amanda, can you explain what PR is to you? And Mm -hmm. then I kind of want to dive into what it's not as well. I mean, we, we definitely talked about like what it's not, which it's not, it's definitely not marketing, but like anything that maybe a client or somebody has misunderstood and you're like, no, it's actually this instead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I agree with everything that Sarah said. And, and as you said, Lydia, it can be so many different things, including issues. I mean, there's whole agencies that focus on issues management, right? Some people even considering lobbying PR when you come from an area like healthcare, there's so many different things, like even within a, a corporate organization, there's multiple PR groups that focus on different things, whether it's internal corporate, but to me, for the purposes of, you know, what we all do, I think for the most part and what your listeners probably are interested in is it's, it's really about influencing perception and visibility and credibility. And I do see it as earned media, right? So it's like, we're, you know, you guys talk about this all the time and it's just, you know, a lot of people don't understand that you need to earn it. We don't control what these people ultimately do. We can do our best to build relationships and pitch people to them in the best way, but we cannot guarantee anything basically from soup to nuts other than putting (laughs) them in touch, right? Like they have to pick up the ball and run with it. But at the end of the day, it's an opportunity to borrow somebody else's audience. And I think, you know, we can have these owned platforms that we can talk on till the cows come home, if you will, but you're still talking to your own captive audience. And if you don't get out there and expand and actually reach other people's audiences in a way that's credible beyond the advertising, which there's value for all of it. I mean, like they always used to say in corporate PR is part of the marketing mix, right? Like one of those like annoying buzzy terms that people use, but it really is the truth. But I think it's a really important part of the marketing mix not to eliminate because it is what is going to buy you ultimately credibility and further reach. Um, And yes, like it intersects with all of those other things. In terms of what it is not to kind of lead us into the next question, I always say, and I know like there's a lot of ways we, you know, you could debate this and talk about it, but something that is really important to me, especially coming from an environment where we're working with really big budgets and there was a lot of expectation around metrics, which can be tough to measure sometimes from a PR point of view, And then moving over to this side, like one of the first things I did was really make sure that prospective clients understood that PR is not a sales tactic. And while it can support sales and it can create a warm audience for sales, 
by design, it is not intended to increase sales. They, you know, there's so much more that has to go into it and be in place in order for it to do that. So like, for me, that's one of the things that's even in my contract where it's, you know, and, and if it does drive sales, that's great. I'm a big fan of under promise and over deliver, but I never want to have that conversation with a client and not have it be clear going in, because I think that that is a really common misperception that you're going to go on podcast and immediately people are going to start buying where I see it as people get to know you better so that they'll they'll dive deeper with you and then mm -hmm. want to buy from you eventually after they're sort of, you know, you get that 360 degree, um, you know, all those touch points that all those other tactics offer. I would love to add to that too. When I think it's beautiful that you line that up for clients before you even start working with them of the intention is not to sell because I feel like if people go on podcasts with that intention or I speaking from the podcast example, if people go on podcasts with that intention, it's going to, they're just going to be a, a walking sales pitch, which is not what hosts want. Like it should mm -hmm. be lead with expertise, lead with value, tangible yes. value for the audience. Don't just be plugging your product the whole time. And I think it's important to your point, Amanda, to make sure that a client understands that before they go mm -hmm. into it, because then they won't be going in saying, Hey, buy my product now. It's like, no, this is what I have to educate to maybe set you up to buy the product six months from now. Yeah. That is I, such a good point. Mm -hmm. It's such a Agreed. good point. All of us are like, yes, yes. <laughs> it's such a good point. Amanda, I love that you said, um, I, the, this is the terminology that I really love that you said. It's like creating that positive buying culture. Cause that's truly mm -hmm. what it does. And Sarah, I kind of want to pivot because I haven't had a product client in, in a while. Um, mm -hmm. and when I used to do a ton of product PR, mm -hmm. it was more geared toward editorial. And then every once in a while I would do podcasts, but it wasn't like a main focus. And I know that you have a product facing company that their main focus is podcast, which is interesting to me. So yeah. when you are helping a client maybe get on a podcast, like do you media train them? Like, how do you, how do you discuss angles? So you kind of keep them on track so they don't become like a walking sales pitch for the episode. Yes. No, that's a great question. It really depends on where they're starting. So I've had some clients where literally our main project to begin with is they landed X big interview that they're paying to go on. How can we make the most of that? And so we'll train for literally six to nine months, like an hour per week leading up to it to like make sure that they have their story right for that audience, for that host, like knowing everything about that host. I will literally go in and act like I'm the host and say like the questions that I imagine they would ask. And we just work out like every single, like every possible degree that or like 360 degree, what, what could they even potentially ask about and how would you want to approach that? Um, but then the main, I'm thinking of like a handful of other brands I've worked with where they have, they've maybe already done that media training or they've done enough podcasts to begin with, where they pretty much know how to educate their consumer. So it's more about, um, building out different talking points, different expert angles. Cause that's how we secure unpaid quote founder interviews, because a lot of people actually don't know that people will pay like upwards of 50, 75, $100,000 to do a quote founder interview, but we can secure those for free if we pitch the founder as an expert on a topic rather than the founder of a company. We say they're the expert on, I don't know, I can't think of an example right now, but they're <laughs> the expert on something they'll provide yeah. tangible value to your audience. Oh, they also happen to found a company. Um, they might not even mention it in the um, podcast, but they just want to lead with value and give your audience tangible things to move forward with. So um, I think that would be a key piece of advice if you're pitching a product and don't want to keep getting on sales calls with um, podcast marketing teams or agencies. It's like, um, how can you position it more as education rather than selling? And helping clients see the value in that too, because I think that's the hard part too. They think if they can't sell mm -hmm. <clears throat> that they're missing an opportunity where again, it comes back to the point of you're warming people up to want to okay. know you more and buy from you eventually. Totally. And if they're, I mean, if they're not on board with the whole education side of things, it's like, we can show them that we can yeah. track links from the show notes and say, mm -hmm. oh, this episode got people onto your website where they bought. Like there are other ways to show where this got mm -hmm. people to follow you on Instagram, like take a screenshot of how many followers they have to begin with, like mm -hmm. you do Amanda versus, um, versus um, where you are after like six months of working together. There are a lot of different ways to track metrics that might not be direct revenue. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think it's such a big reframe um, 
because of the, the idea, what you were saying, the, the idea and concept of like, oh, I'm missing out if I'm not sharing my product. But Bridget and I talk about this all the time. Like we are both big co- podcast junkies. Like I have brought this up. If you've listened to the show over and over again, you have heard me say there was one specific interview. I was literally I going to say this. I'm so glad you're saying it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there was one specific any- interview where I was cleaning my room and I was like, let me just throw in a podcast while I'm doing this. And I saw, um, it was a podcast that I really enjoy. And I saw that the founder of it cosmetics was being interviewed and I'm like, Oh, I don't really like it cosmetics. Like I've seen them in the store and I kind of walk by them. I think it's just for rosacea. Like, I don't think it's even for me, but let me just put it on whatever. So I put it on, walked around, clean, cleaned my room. I was blown away by mm-hmm. the founder's story. She literally did not talk about it cosmetics. She, I mean, she did at the end, like when she was prompted, but her story was just sharing like how she fell into the beauty space and how she was a waitress. And then she just like got this idea and this opportunity and her relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And like, it was just like, so not what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. And that one interview converted me to a fan where I was like, Oh, okay. I'm going to go buy their products now because I love the founder so much. I mean, Mm -hmm. I am, I'm literally wearing a bra right now that I bought from (laughs) podcast. So I'm just like, this is, third love. No, it's true. It's, it's third so love, true. Yeah. yeah. People buy from you because they like you Correct. more than they buy because they yeah. like your product. And that's well, just the truth. Mm-hmm. I love that example too, with Jamie Kern Lima, right. Is she, she's founder of it cosmetics. I think she did kind of like a podcast tour around her book launch. So that might be something helpful too, for anybody working with a product founder, it's like, ask that founder, if you were to write a book, what would it be about? Or Mm -hmm. if you were to, and this is something I work on with clients, it's like three, and this often happens like several months into working together. When I've listened to enough of their interviews, when we've had enough strategy calls, building out three expert angles, three things they can speak, or three expert talking points, topics, three things that are very diverse they can speak to. And then under that building 27 unique story angles. So it's like having, being able to ideally pitch anybody to literally any podcast or any, any media outlet, not that they'd want to be anywhere, but you should be able to position them for pretty much anyone. I think, because everybody's so interesting. They can speak to so many different things. Yeah. smart. I feel like it always comes back to the reminder of educating the founder that storytelling is going to go so much further than you just selling a product. But of course they're probably used to just like getting on the phone and selling their product. Like that's what they've been good at. That's how they've grown the company, but this is a different angle and just reminding them that stories go so far. And that's what actually builds the trust and credibility. Like when someone actually hears your story and they go, Oh my God, like I can, I can relate to that person. I get it. Like, this is amazing. So I love these points. Um, I feel like Lydia wants, I feel like Lydia has a good question. I do have a good question. I was like messaging you about it. I'm like, Ooh, I feel like this is something that you ask all the time. So something that comes up in a lot of, I mean, this is like since the dawn of time of me doing PR is how to tell clients that are in different industries to, or coach them, I guess, to meet their audience where they're at on podcasts. And what I mean by this is like, there are different languages that or that are in different niches and it becomes our world. We don't realize that like, not everybody understands what that is. Like for an example, you know, I have, I had a client that was like a manifestation expert for a while and she, I had to help her, um, understand the words that she uses are not understood in somebody who does not, or is not in that world. So like, how do we coach? And this could be for any industry. It could be for healthcare. It could be for, I don't know, a beer connoisseur. Like I I think it could be for anything. So what do you do and how do you approach that? That I'm, I'm actually like gearing this towards Amanda. It's so funny. You're like, I'm like staring at you, but how do you approach this? Oh, it's so funny. Well, you know, this is something that I've been sort of, you know, dealing with lately, but you know, I'll I'll even take it back a step further. And when I think about back in pharma, a lot of times we would be dealing with consumer media because in the U S we're actually allowed to market pharmaceuticals to consumers for better or worse. Um, but like we would have to work with these super, super intelligent physicians to talk about data in a way that was very understandable. And so I came from a world where what I did was take very complicated scientific data and translate it for media, you know, and, and lay audiences so that it, you know, you would understand what's the takeaway from this. And so I think it it is, it's the same thing in this world too, because I think, especially when you work in anything related to spirituality, there's going to be, like you're saying, language that is not going to resonate with 
everybody. And so it, it is really challenging. And I've been dealing with this actually currently with a client where she is a like an actual, you know, she was a, a stockbroker and she has a program that she is teaching people how to invest, but she's also talking at a very, very high spiritual level. And so on some shows, I mean, they can go off in these like very deep tangents about spirituality, which is wonderful for those audiences, but it can be challenging, I think, for some of the more mainstream podcasts that will touch on spirituality, yeah. but it has to be positioned in a way that feels very tangible for people. And I think, you know, it's sort of a little bit of a, like a rub too, because like really what she offers is so tangible combined with the mindset stuff. But I think, you know, when the client prefers to talk about the one piece that is more difficult, it's, it's like, how do you get them to move to the other side? And so, you know, I've, I've found it a little bit difficult to do it just off the the bat because you know you want your clients also yeah. to be spontaneous and i think the, the yeah. challenge is that you don't want to coach especially on podcasts probably with digital media a little bit different because it's more you know a back and forth interview or you can type something up that can be edited but on podcasts i don't want people to obviously be self-editing while they're talking and yeah. so what i have actually found to be helpful is to flag the podcasts that are really really good where I'm like, you did such an excellent job here of combining the two pieces, to, you know, weaving them together in a way that people can understand. That's helped. And then the other thing I've been considering too is actually taking the podcasts that are really good and I think balanced and starting to kind of actually pull out questions to even suggest as I pitch, like here, you know, or, or once the podcast is secured, like giving them a list of questions to ask that will lead her in that direction too. Cause I think it's, you know, it's challenging on both sides. Um, yeah. So I, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect because yeah. like, I, I love, it's so funny how we could be in the same industries. We could be, I could even pitch some of your clients and vice versa, but the way that I would approach it would be so different from your mm -hmm. perspective. So I love hearing this. Cause I'm like, Ooh, this gives me new ideas too. Mm -hmm. Like, like I, Sarah, I love that you said that you kind of do like mock interviews. Like I have never done that once. So I think that's really valuable, especially for, um, if you're doing like a paid advertised type of podcast, like th those are high stakes for them. That's a lot of money. So how can we make the most of it? So I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. And then Amanda, like highlighting the episodes that they did really well on and sharing questions is so great. So whoever is listening, if you're doing this for yourself or you're having a publicist, like these are great. I like pitch for you. These are great ideas and different approaches that you can implement for yourself that can really just make the most of a PR campaign. Mm -hmm. One thing that I think would be interesting for our audience too. Like one thing that you said in the beginning, Amanda was PR is really about leveraging other people's platforms and getting in front of new audiences. And I would assume that some of our, you know, audience members might be asking themselves, how do I know what are the right platforms? How do I know what are the right audiences? Like what kind of, um, whether it's digital media, whether it's print, whether it's a stage, whether it's a podcast, like how do they know? And you're going to do, you're thinking of this from the publicist perspective. So what is your thought process there? And like, how do you figure out where you want to get your clients featured? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And podcasts in particular, I think are tricky because so many shows that um, feel like they can touch multiple audiences. And so it's always really important for me to make sure my clients understand that there's no perfect audience mm -hmm. for them. And if you want to reach people really broadly, you have to accept that you're going to reach, you know, a big group of people, but there may only be a subset. Right. And I think that's good because it also it stretches them to expand yeah. outward and touch other people that might be interested. You know, and I think, I mean, and I, I think probably all of you would agree, the best PR approach is the multi-pronged approach where you're hitting it from all directions. I mean, you're go always going to see the most impact when you're speaking, when you're using digital media, when you're on podcasts, and they all add something different to that mix that I think it really is a beautiful blend of getting people out there and letting people see, you know, the different facets of you in different ways. So, you know, you might be reaching a smaller audience if you're speaking at an event, but it's also so much more high touch and people are, you're going to actually get to meet with people after afterwards and shake hands and talk and learn, which is going to, um, you know, if it's the right speaking audience, of course, too. And sometimes that's challenging because, you know, for example, I have a client in Australia and so there could be so many opportunities here in the U S but she's not here all the time. So I think it's looking at every client individually and trying to figure out what's the best combination and then almost just weighting the different pieces to um to kind of then like you know sort of split it out and figure out what's going to offer them the most value mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I mm-hmm. love that you shared this approach because also I think like every single client I've had or who joins pitch party, they'll come in and they're like, I want to be on Oprah. I want to be on Cosmo. I also want to be on this podcast that I love. And realizing that, yes, you can be on those, but we need to also remember that these types, like the outlets are in it for themselves. They're in it for their audiences, their value. And so how can we meet them halfway, provide value without giving our entire story or like something that, you know, feels good to us. Like there are some clients that I've had where they're like, this is my mission, but they also have expertise that are in X, Y, Z that got them to their quote unquote mission or whatever it is that they really, really want to share. So it's like, how can we provide value that may not feel like crazy meaningful to you, Mm -hmm. but it it is meaningful to maybe Cosmo or Oprah and then kind of give them the breadcrumbs. Mm -hmm. I always think about it as like, how can we invite people into our space um, and give them the breadcrumbs to come in? So PR to me, and I would love to hear your perspectives, but PR to me is more about um, invitations and different audiences and then they can come to our website and maybe purchase something or maybe they maybe they just come into our instagram or social medias and start following us and then we get to nurture that audience and eventually it converts and this is how it's like not sales but like Mm -hmm. how do you um sarah how do you see this perspective of like i guess telling a client how we can invite people in without them getting like a full feature i guess in oprah or something right off the bat totally so i feel like well I don't know if this is going to directly answer the question, but when you mentioned like how to make this valuable to Cosmo or different specific outlets, yeah. it's like going from the like publicist perspective, it's like going to those um, different outlets and seeing how they're even titling their articles, seeing like what are the action steps for those audiences. It's like if they always are like for a podcast, if they always have titles and like the three things you need to do today to up-level your life. It's like, you should position the talking points and numbers. Like you should like literally yeah. give them the title so they'll bite at it. And that's a matter too of like inviting the invitation. Like I'm a projector in human design. So it's like, it's, which is maybe weird that I'm like initiating things, but it's not necessarily like being forward of like, you should bring this client on, but it's like inviting them to invite the client by means of making it easy for them to say yes, if that makes mm-hmm. sense. Um, yeah. And also I had another thought, um, and this was, again, I, I'm forgetting the original question, but it made me think of it when Amanda earlier, when you were talking about um, the, oh, the different audiences, how there's not a perfect audience. And so this might more directly answer your question, Lydia. Um, I don't think, I think that's a good thing that there's not a perfect audience because if, for instance, if you're like a skincare brand and you think you need to just be talking to on skincare podcasts, it's like, no, you should be talking on wellness podcasts. You should be speaking on um, like personal development, people who are looking for self-growth and to like up-level their confidence. Like there are a lot of different um, different types of shows that will be better than that hit the nail on the head skincare because they pro- those skincare shows probably already have their favorite brands. Mm-hmm. So it's like, and that's not to say they can't have a new favorite, mm-hmm. but it's like, how can we hit new audiences that are tangential or talking yeah. around what you mm-hmm. talk about without directly already talking about it? Um, I didn't so answer good. your question at all. No, no, what no, no. That was, no, I think that you answered it. That was so okay. good because okay. I think, um, I think we, it, it's, I always feel about that. Like PR is a lot of education and like mm-hmm. educating the clients, like the method behind our madness, mm-hmm. because what mm-hmm. you just said was super valuable. Like thinking about, okay, how can we make the most of this campaign to get the logos, but also mm-hmm. like, what are the right audiences to bring in the mm-hmm. clients? Like, like what you just said about skincare, maybe you're a skincare brand, but if we're going on a skincare podcast, like, yeah, there's some experts, like high profile experts mm-hmm. that might be on there that are also in that industry too. But like, if I'm a skincare brand, like it cosmetics and I go on a wellness podcast yeah. and I talk about my story, like I am, I would imagine that the flood of individuals mm-hmm. that didn't know about it cosmetics maybe isn't a big skincare fan or makeup fan, but now learned about this story became fans and converted to fans mm-hmm. because of that story. So mm-hmm. what you said there was super powerful. I want to pivot to human design because we mentioned mm-hmm. this a few times. Uh, the three of us have super different all actually, no, no. Yeah. With yeah actually, I think all four two- of us do because Bridget, you're a manifesting generator, right? She acts no, like I'm just one. a regular oh, you're, generator. You're generator. I know okay, everyone so thinks you and I are I'm the same. Then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So we have two generators, we have a projector and we have a manifester, which is neat. So, um, I'm going to let Amanda talk about this one since you were the human design gal, but like, 
I, it was funny. I was sharing, uh, how you guys got to your positions today to Bridget before we brought you on the podcast. And I'm like, yeah, they both have fourth lines, which I've now learned is about community. Mm. So I'd love to hear Amanda, like how human design can help us in our approaches. And also maybe like, I think, you know, all of our designs and then Bridget can share her. She will, I'll share it. She's a generator three, five. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny. I never thought because I'm not a manifesting generator. And so I'm not necessarily meant to sort of like merge multiple things together in a certain way, but, um, but this still feels very fitting for me. And so as I was sort of on my little break and exploring and figuring out where my PR journey was going to take me, I discovered human design. And so what it did for me was gave me so much permission to realize that like, oh, look, all the ways I want to present myself in the world are actually right. And I've been trying to fit this mold, you know, of, of like this perfect professional person that does everything else and toes the line and fits into this, you know, little um, cookie cutter mold. And I did that for so many years. And I was like, wow, all these things actually are letting me be more authentic. And so what I started to realize eventually was that there was just this, you know, because obviously PR is so much about the way we present ourselves to people to influence perception that I was like, why would we not put these two, like, why would I not put these two things together for clients that are open to it? Because what I think it does is, you know, in addition to sort of giving you permission to be who you know you are on the inside, but maybe you're like afraid to present outwardly. I think it also gives us words sometimes to, that we might not be able to confidently claim on our own or even articulate like things like energies within ourselves that we feel. And I think the gene keys do this a lot too. So I will use that in messaging sometimes when I develop pitches for clients, you know, because it gives you all these life themes and words around these big energies and our personalities that you're like, so sometimes people will be like, oh, wow. Like, yeah, like I've always felt that, but I never would have had the words to say it. And what I find is it actually really resonates when I put that information in pitches. Even if I'm not using the wording exactly, I make sure that underlying um, sentiment or feeling or essence is there within each pitch. And I have found that it has made such a difference in getting people. Because I also think there's just an authenticity that then comes through. And I'm a big believer in that people kind of feel us more than they even hear us. And I think when you can feel the truth in something, you know, energetically, whether people are aware of that or not. I think we all have that sense, um, you know, however conscious we are of it, it makes a really big difference. And it's kind of fun even just to think about how I, like, like Lydia, if I look at even, and Sarah, like, Sarah, you touched on this. When I look at the way the three of us might pitch, like, I'm like, Lydia, you're so amazing at digital and initiating these opportunities, but that's what you're here to do. And so for you (laughs) to bring an idea to a reporter or journalist and say, you know, like, here's something that I can offer you that would offer value, but I'm, it may not have been something they've ever thought about, but they tend to be open to it. Right. And you're, you're so good at that. Where for me, not that I haven't had success there, but I find more success as a generator, because I'm meant to be in response, when I have had a ton of success with things like Harrow, now Hero, and yeah. Quoted, and um, I follow a gazillion reporter substacks, and I just find that for me, because I'm in response to something that I need, these opportunities just kind of appear out of nowhere. And I'm like, oh my God, this is so perfect. And then they just tend to work out. And Sarah, like you said, I mean, you're as a projector meant to be visible. So like when you Mm -hmm. make yourself visible to these outlets and Mm -hmm. show them what you have to offer them, you're Mm -hmm. guiding their energy to these new, you're like presenting that wisdom to them. And so then they're inviting your clients because you're creating space for an invitation without using like assertive language, like you said. And so it's just interesting to see how, when we even understand our own energetics in PR, like it can affect how we conduct our outreach. Cause even when I do pitch, I always pitch and note something that I'm responding to that the reporter or the podcast host has done so that it feels in response, even if I'm bringing them something new. So it's kind of, it's, it's fun. And I really do think that it, it helps. Mm-hmm. That's a, a great point too, on the guiding. I didn't like mm-hmm. for my pitch strategy, I never saw it as, um, I, until we just started talking about it. So I didn't really see it as inviting until now I'm, I'm seeing, like, I will always mention, I love your show. I listen on in XYZ settings. I loved this episode. And what I see for the future of your show is blah, blah, blah. And I don't exactly. say it that way. Yeah. Like, you're guiding their, you're, guiding, you're taking, you're guiding their energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is fun. The wise projector you. Yeah. No, it's funny. Cause I never think I don't take my clients like charts. Like I don't really incorporate their stuff, but I do notice a lot more success when I am, for instance, like I'm very 
weird about follow-ups. Like I don't like annoying people. I don't like bugging people. And I find that like, when I don't feel excited about following up, I really shouldn't because they're probably mm-hmm. going to perceive it as like projector being overbearing. And I should probably just like wait for again, the right, like I notice they bring on a guest that is like tangentially related to another topic I want them to cover. Then I'll follow up then. Um, mm-hmm. So I kind of implement I implement my own strategy and authority. You trust it. your energy. That's yeah. what I would say the most go. important thing that anybody can do yeah. is trust their energy and like where yeah. it wants to go. I For also sure. think it's interesting, like Amanda, you were just saying, and I am like human design with training wheels on. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you were just saying that like Sarah is supposed to be seen. And I think it's so interesting because Sarah is I remember when we first got connected, I was trying to like, look you up, do my like PR thing where I was like, oh, let me look at her Instagram and like wherever. And she is like, so under the radar, <laughs> She's still <laughs> fine. but yeah. you go on press, like tours with your clients. Mm-hmm. You were just talking about doing like speaking opportunities, which I'd love to like hear a little bit more about too. Like what that process is like, because I don't really do that too much. Mm-hmm. Um, but like you are seen in the physical. And so mm-hmm. I'm like, Oh, this makes so much sense. And also if I were to like, hang out with you and see you, like, I would immediately be like, yes, you were invited in. So I get it. That's so funny. Yeah, no, I love it's, I think it's like, this is just me responding to like the social media landscape. Like, and I think we've spoken about this before, and this is going to come across as judgmental, but I kind of feel like people who are, um, look like they're living their best life on social media. Like your the quality of your life is inversely proportional to how it looks on social media. So I like to be known in person and I like to be fully buttoned up online, but I do have account. I do have social media accounts. I just don't really use them except for work stuff. Cause often people like pitches through DMS, which is really interesting. Um, but anyway, True. I, um, yes, with the press tour, question this and this maybe does go to um, being a projector as well as my business has purely been directed by what people want from me or what people see in me so like I don't have a website it's purely grown through referral and it's what clients are needing in different moments so what I've noticed the past probably six months is people just want to do a lot of in-person opportunities and they'll just be like hey I'm going to Austin book as many opportunities for me there or I'm going to literally London and Paris or I'm going to I'm going to be like I don't know upstate New York is there anything there for me And I found that it's funny because if I find opportunities for one client, then naturally there's going to be more stuff for other, I'm able to plant those seeds for further or further relationships to develop for other clients down the line and tangentially related. I found having more clients, I think we've spoken about this before, having more clients makes our lives easier because we're able to leverage higher profile client as a foot in the door for another (laughs) opportunity for somebody else later which maybe sounds manipulative, but I think it is how it works. It's like, we're building relationships and providing Mm -hmm. value. And once we prove that there's value, then we can bring somebody else along for the ride too. Yeah. They trust you, right? Like they trust trust. that you're giving them good people. I, yeah, I find the same. Yeah. Yeah. It's a trust thing. Like the, it's so hard. Sometimes I feel like to get in the door, like there's certain people that I've pitched for like a solid seven years and they have not responded to one of my emails, but I'm like, one of these days they're gonna, they, I can see that they're opening my email. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty funny. Sometimes it does take time and consistency and it just takes that like perfect, uh, like pitch where they're like, Oh, this is exactly what I need now. But once you actually get in the door and this is where like the higher profile clients can help sometimes because they'll see the shiny name and then they realize that you are trustworthy, Mm -hmm. but it's Mm -hmm. like coming through and providing excellent service. Like I never once will send along a, um, expert commentary that hasn't been fully edited by me where Mm -hmm. I've heard writers say like, oh yeah, publicists will just send along things with like grammatical errors and issues. And I can't even use it. And like, thank you so much for, for for, like editing this, or thank you so much for Mm -hmm. sending me like the credit line and the headshot and the bio without me asking you. So Mm -hmm. Bridget and I, in our programs, we're always like, make sure that you minimize the back and forth and anticipate their needs. Because once you do that, you're going to build that, that trust and that will minimize, um, any sort of like gatekeeping or like, Mm -hmm. you know, not being able to get through the door. Yeah. It's our job to make their job easier. And that's, that's how I always tend to look at it. Even I know like for a lot of clients, when we pass off opportunities to their, their people to schedule or whatever it might be. Yeah. I'm always like guiding them in terms of how to, you know, if they don't hear anything or how, you know, cause I think sometimes people don't 
understand like either they're too assertive with the podcast host or they're afraid to go yeah. back and so i think there's even an educational component there too and how to engage once we pass it off mm -hmm. to make sure that we maintain that relationship and nothing happens to jeopardize it well, I, I think it goes both ways too, because it's not just about building that relationship with the reporter or the host. It's also about like, our job is to represent our client. So mm -hmm. if we're not editing their yeah, text oh, yeah. for them, like that shines poorly on them on and us. then it makes, yeah. And then on us too. So I think there's that element and then, um, darn it. There was something else. Keep going. It, you know, it's funny. Like I will, if I am not 150% sure of something, I will Google it. And this goes down mm -hmm. to like, is there a hyphen in these words? Or like, yeah. if a client is referencing, like, um, my favorite book is blah, 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 the title, I will Google it and make sure that they wrote the title down correctly, that they spelled mm -hmm. this person's name, right. Because it's super embarrassing for them too. If somehow it gets through the cracks and it's then published as them being quoted and they're, they're spelling this person's name wrong or mm -hmm. something. So I always, is like go above and beyond with that and like fact check. And there, there's so many different ways that you can do it. Um, that you can do like grammarly. I have like all these different, I actually, this is my, my life hack for anyone who's interested, but sometimes I get so exhausted by reading that I, I just got this plugin that reads for me. <laughs> What's so, it called? Uh, I have no idea. I literally Googled like speak and read out loud and found this. Like, I mean, I hope it's not like creating, seriously, I hope it's not creating viruses on my computer, but like, <laughs> yeah. I will just let it read for me sometimes because I, when we're reading in our heads, it, it's so easy to like roll over grammatical errors because we think in our minds that they like did mm -hmm. it right. And so sometimes hearing it from a different perspective or maybe speaking it out loud really helps. So actually on this topic, do you guys have any like little hacks? Sarah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, this isn't a little hack. This is like a big hack that I'm going to pull mm -hmm. from our previous thread and pull it into this one. Because I think when it comes to building relationships with reporters, it's not even just about our, what we're doing. It's also about investing in relationships with other publicists, because I think a lot of people yes. see this as competitive mm -hmm. or like, I see it as like, I see it as like, if we're sharing, I, I how do I want to put it? We've had multiple conversations, I think, behind closed doors about maybe sharing contacts and how like, oh, so-and-so wanted this contact and like, they, like I earned that. But it, like, really like it comes down to like your relationship with the, like it, the contacts aren't really what we own. It's the relationship we own, but also right. we can, if we build relationships with other publicists, then we're able, and maybe they had success with somebody that we didn't. And likewise, they haven't had success with somebody that we have. We can share those. We can make those introductions. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that has been exponential for, um, growth in all of our careers, I think. Yeah. So that's yeah, like I think that's what it, yeah. I mean, I remember Lydia, when I reached out to you like a year ago, cause I had heard you on, I forget what podcast it was, but I was like, is it weird for me to reach out to another publicist who's doing like the same type of work? Cause when I think about going back to that corporate world, like you would never do that. Like I would never yeah. reach out to someone at a, like another agency, but I just really trusted my gut. And I was like, I don't know if something makes me want to connect with her. And I just, you know, so I sent you that email. I'm like, I was like so nervous. I'm like, well, well you know, will she be like, you know, hell no, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to, but it just, you know, it, it's funny. Cause I think that, and then Sarah, like I met you through Jess and then we ended up partnering together on accounts. And I think yeah. when you work in such a silo, the way we do in this world, there is nothing more valuable than having like a little bit of a, like a brain, not even a little bit, like having the brain trust that the three of us have when we come together to share information and mastermind. And I think it's probably one of the best things that we've done is start meeting monthly to just yeah. even like, help problem solve and brainstorm. I just think you can't underestimate the value of those relationships. Mm -hmm. And I agree. Like, I think it, it doesn't take any, it doesn't diminish in any way the, the opportunities or the clients or whatever, you know, we're meant to call in. I think if anything, it makes us more powerful. So I love that too, Sarah. So thank you for bringing that up. Well, it makes me think too, of like similar conversation of like having more clients makes life easier. Having more like constructive meetings and like brainstorm sessions can mm -hmm. give us more energy and more ideas for, um, clients and also collaborating on certain clients. I think that's been key too, because a lot of mm -hmm. us, to your point, being in a silo, like we feel, I don't know, I, I often, I often take blame to a fault where if a client brings an issue to me, I'm like, I am so sorry. That's my fault. Whereas if it's like, if I have somebody else on my team to say like, Hey, actually that wasn't you. It, it just it mm -hmm. alleviates a lot of the pressure that maybe we don't need to take on if we're able to collaborate on projects together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I was talking to Bridget about this and it's, I feel like there's been so much unlearning and Bridget knows this from firsthand. And it's been such a breath of fresh air to actually work with Bridget because she doesn't come from the, (laughs) the background of PR where, where Mm -hmm. I have like so much, I'm like, Oh no, it has to be done this way. And she's like, well, why won't, why don't we just do it this way? And so it's like, almost like those, that beautiful, like childlike type of like, what am I looking for? I'm looking for, um, innocence but, coming into the, yeah. Like, well, like my like, unknowing, like, I don't know. So I'm just like thinking of other creative solutions. Yeah, and you I can think outside the box because yeah. you haven't been conditioned to think conditioned. like most of us have. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So I remember when you reached out to me, I, I was actually <laughs> perfect time. Cause I was feeling super jaded and you reached out to me and it was just such a genuine email. You were like, Hey, like, you know, I found you here. I think that we have a lot in common. Like, I hope you don't think this is weird. I'm reaching out. And I was like, this is so cute. Like I showed Spencer that email right after you sent it. I was like, look how nice this is. I'm so excited. And then you ended up introducing me to Jess, which is one of my best friends mm-hmm. down here now. Um, you introduced me to Sarah and it's funny. I heard about Sarah in the industry, but I didn't actually get to meet her. And so it was just, it, it's such, it's been such a beautiful reframe. And also I was telling Bridget before this, like a genuine healing for me, because I come from the entertainment background, which is extremely competitive. People gatekeep the fuck out of their contacts. Mm-hmm. Like I remember I was having a really hard time getting a um, premiere, which is they, they call it premieres, but it's like that one piece of press that like announces a song when it comes out. And it was with a huge record label and a huge artist. And I was like having a really hard time nailing them an amazing press piece for the song. And like, there's so much pressure in the music industry to get the perfect press piece and to do the songs justice. Cause you don't have just the artist, but you have their entire team, the record labels on your back, the management, then you have the agency's reputation. Like it is a lot of stress and they, people will just, no one was there to help is what I'm saying. And you were truly there on your own. And so it's very interesting to, to work at agencies or even in the beauty industry, it's the same way. And so work at industries and have an entire team, but also feel very much like you're working by yourself. So this has been a beautiful experience. Like we, we meet monthly and we have our own mastermind. It's not like paid. It's not like we're literally just friends meeting up and helping each other. And it's been so beautiful. Bridget, I'm going to pass my mic over to you because <laughs> we have been just going off, but I, I mean, yeah, this, it's just been awesome. I love you it's guys. It's funny. Normally mm-hmm. I have lots to say. I feel like I'm just really receiving all this. And I think our audience is going to love this too, because it is a little bit of the other side of the coin. Like our mm-hmm. audience is looking to, you know, get the features for themselves, but like, I think a big theme that has been here today is education. A lot of business owners do not know anything about PR. They have no idea how this like intricate industry works and how all the relationships are really at the core of it. And I think it just brings us back to like, honestly, me and Lydia's mission, which is Mm -hmm. community people, like bringing the people together and teaching them what Mm -hmm. they what we know and what we want to share with them. So I think this has been such a great conversation. I honestly don't even have any more questions, which is so unlike me, Lydia. Well, I'm like, I just I have want to say that I love, I love what you guys <laughs> yeah. are doing. Cause I think what you're doing is so important. And I agree that okay. there's so much gatekeeping in PR. And I think that's what it is. Like, I'm always like, you know, why, why do we have to have this curtain where nobody can yeah. see what's going on? And I feel like even in corporate, it was like that a lot of times nobody wanted to allow even clients to really understand. And I never liked that or (laughs) felt good about it. And so I just think it's wonderful to open it up and let people do, you know, like even if they want to spend an hour or two on it a week, just to have those skills. And, Mm -hmm. you know, like that doesn't diminish what any of us are doing or take clients Mm -hmm. away from us because a lot of these people are business owners that are kind of left with nothing but that marketing funnel approach and they can't afford a publicist because they're trying to grow their business Mm -hmm. and even getting out there like I was thinking about this earlier with like even the smallest audience if it's the right audience there is so much value in getting out there and talking to that audience because they're the people that you're looking for and so I think even just wherever like I just always want to encourage people that are doing their own PR that wherever you start it's great because you're Mm -hmm. still reaching even if it's 50 people that you didn't touch before that's 50 people. And then you continue to ladder up to bigger and bigger shows. So, so kudos to the two of you. I love what you're doing. 
Um, I had an idea too that came up as, you know, going back to the initial question of what is PR, like through all this, I think one thing that kind of came to mind, I feel like it's like a refinement and distillation. People will maybe come to us or maybe you as a business owner, whoever's listening, um, you have all these ideas of what you're doing, of what you think maybe will resonate with different audiences, but it's really a matter of refining and distilling that over time with each pitch, it gets better, it gets sharper, mm -hmm. it gets more tailored to each audience. And I think like the, A, it's a matter of helping, um, whether again, if you're a publicist or if you're somebody representing yourself, it's a matter of um, presenting yourself in the light you wanna be presented, or I don't know, being presented in the light you wanna be presented in, and then also helping people or at least from our standpoint as publicists, helping people see themselves in a different light that maybe they're not mm -hmm. able to see. And so again, coming back to a hack, it's like, if you're representing yourself, it's like literally just ask chat GPT, what are five other ways to say this? Or like, who are like maybe five different types of audiences? How can I mm -hmm. tailor that to them? And like, just really refining, distilling your message, finding different ways to position it, and then learning about yourself through that whole process. I think that's a part of it too. It's like- being Yeah, and owning it, like, right? Owning yeah. those things and claiming them. I think that's, again, why yeah. human design was so key for me. And even I have like reports, which I think I sent to, I don't know if I ever sent you yours, Sarah. I'll have to send it to you, but I do a little communications by design report. And I think sometimes it just gives people the confidence to go out in a certain way and just kind of say like, oh, I can do this, or this is how I'm meant to speak, or this is what kind of motivates my communications. And so I think however people get there, it's just finding that confidence to just own what you want, own what you believe and own mm -hmm. your authenticity. And I think that is what ultimately will resonate with both audiences and the media that you're trying to attract. Totally. Yeah, I love that. Thank you guys so much. I think I want to end this with, uh, and we've alluded to this in a few different ways, but that PR really is a long-term strategy and there are puzzle pieces or maybe stepping stones that need to happen before we get to like really big, um, really big campaigns. So I, I don't know the right question, so maybe you can help me, but I would love to hear from Sarah and Amanda, like what that's looked like working with clients long-term and like how mm -hmm. different campaigns have shaped. So I guess mm -hmm. I'll, I'll start with Sarah because you're closest to me. <laughs> that's a great. That's a big question. I always think of it in terms of like a slingshot, like mm -hmm. we're going to take a smaller opportunity and then slingshot it to get bigger ones. And so you mentioned this earlier, people like wanting, I don't know if it was like be on Joe Rogan, whatever that might be, they think that's right. a fit for them. And it's like, A, that's not a fit for you. And B, you're not ready for that. And there's so many, like, we're going to get there. Um, and so it's a matter of leveling up to that. But I think also, um, I guess the question was how, or what it was the question, how you level up to bigger opportunities. I literally don't know what the question is, but okay. I just want to like talk about it and yeah. just see like what your perspective is on it. Because yeah. I think like clients will come to me. I, I love actually that you said like, um, it might not be a fit for you. Cause like I have seen so many people in our generation. So any, uh, millennials <laughs> will come to me and be like, okay, I want to be on cosmopolitan. And I'm like, cosmopolitan is a magazine that you read when you were 16 and it doesn't make sense for what you're talking about literally at all. So this is actually, I know you love loved it when you were 16 and it might feel like it is the, like the magazine, but it's not for you. It's actually not a fit. I yeah. guess. Okay. That's, that's a great point. I think it's a matter of like education around, we might do that or we'll find something better that yeah. you don't even, you're not even thinking of right mm -hmm. now. Like PR, it is a long-term strategy and it just keeps getting better. It's like, there's really, I've never yes. had somebody I work with where like it stops getting better. It just keeps mm -hmm. keep leveling up and you keep leveraging past, past opportunities to something bigger. And I think too, for people who are maybe just starting out, like if you were to have that, um, that really big up, if you have that Forbes feature that like you've been wanting, like you might short circuit if you have that today, like you want to be at a level where you are fully confident in that. Um, and you know, like maybe the message you share today there would be very different than what you're going to share totally 18 mm -hmm. months from now. So it's like just trusting, like, you will, you will share the right message in the right mm -hmm. space, in the right timing. It all just has to align. Yeah. yeah. I like Sarah, like a hundred percent. That's just such a great point. Cause if, if you put some of these people like, you know, in their early PR days in front of some of these big outlets, it might, it might not go as well as maybe they think. I think there's something to be said for practicing and leveling up. And like, I love your slingshot uh, metaphor. Cause I think of it as like a ladder and it's just climbing that ladder. And the higher you climb the ladder, the higher it's like the rungs just keep appearing. And so 
Lydia, like you say, it's a long game. I think that's the other thing that a lot of clients, like I've had to, to nicely let clients go because they were just wanted to see immediate results. And I think, you know, we also don't control when these pieces come out, whether they're podcasts or articles. And that's really challenging for people because they want this immediate hit and it's not advertising where we can control that. And I think so it's, you know, it's just understanding that there's like not a lot of control on our end, other than making that connection and, you know, doing our best to facilitate a great piece at the end of the day. And also like quality over quantity, I think too. So I think sometimes, you know, like we need to look at, is it the right, like we've all been kind of dancing around this, like, is it the right audience? And it could be the right audience and be a, a half, podcast half the size. But if you're reaching an audience that is looking for what you're talking about, it is going to offer you so much more value, whether it's Cosmo or Joe Rogan, if that's not your audience like even you know with like some of my clients too you know like like my human design client she's more like my age like she's in her late 40s and so i think you know there's other human design people out there that are going to resonate with some of these like let's just say like younger digital outlets and so i've kind of just accepted the fact that i need to you know put her where her audience is, which tends to be women that are a little bit more mature, seem more mature. And, yeah. you know, like in, in terms of our age. And so, and that's okay. Cause there's going to be people that are going to resonate with different audiences. And I think it is like, it's understanding where you fit because that's where you're going to have the most impact and see the most return at the end of the end of the day, even if it's like, you know, not Cosmo or whatever it might be. These were such fire points. <laughs> and I think this is a testament to how catered all of us, um, create our campaigns. And I think for anybody listening who wants to do this themselves, we also teach this inside pitch party. It's start with your goals and then really assess, like, does that make sense for me? How can I make this best for my growth? And so what I mean by that is think about what our goals are. So maybe it is Cosmo at first, but then also think about, okay, does this actually serve my bigger purpose of what I really want to do with this campaign? And then we can adjust from there. And I think like all always starting with a little bit of research. We share this a lot. It's like, okay, I, I want to be on these outlets. Let me go on the podcast. Let me go on the, um, magazine and let me just like peruse around and see if what they're talking about actually does resonate with me. And if it does perfect, let's keep them on the list. If it doesn't, maybe we need to go back to the drawing board and kind of like reimagine what this looks like. So always, always catered campaigns. This conversation has been so amazing. I would recommend anybody to either of you. Like mm -hmm. I just, I really Same. put you on such a pedestal. I really do. I'm like, these are, these are the absolute. Well, we even do that. Best. Like if client, if it's a prospects come in, like, I'm like, oh no, this would be better for Lydia than for me. Cause I feel like yes. that's, what's yeah. kind of really, I think just beautiful about the relationship we've built that it's, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think we can, we can look at the big picture and understand mm -hmm. that having the right clients is more important than having, just like having the right placements is more mm -hmm. important than just having any clients or placements. So exactly. It's just looking at PR from such a different perspective, which again has been super healing of like, okay, we can actually, we can actually create better campaigns by collaborating, by deciding what is more aligned for us. And this is better for everybody. So mm -hmm. I just love you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here today, Sarah, where can everybody find you? Amanda, where can everybody find you? And we're going to close on out. <laughs> you can, you can find me in Kansas city. You can find me in person <laughs> or you can email me. <laughs> Um, it's like I'm knock Sarah. on my door. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> like, I don't know. Find me in my apartment. Um, I'm Sarah, S A R A dot D O A N E at gmail.com. And I'm also at Sarah Don on Instagram. I'm private, but I might, I might accept you. We'll see. <laughs> Just reach out. She's the absolute best. And I Amanda, love it. Sarah's the most incognito, like well connected person I know. Thank you. Oh, best that's kept industry that's secret. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so my website is curateyoursoul.com and I'm on Instagram at curate.your.soul. Thank you so much. You guys are absolutely amazing. This this has been such a treat for Bridget and myself. So thank you everybody for listening to another episode of Visibility Era, the podcast. <laughs>